And here is the oldest of them all, the mint at Philadelphia. A far cry from the original structure, this modern, well-protected building affords the inside story on a real money-making proposition. The story behind the pennies, nickels, and dimes spent so casually every day. In 1792, Congress established the first mint in Philadelphia. And in the present building, there's a permanent exhibit of documents and machines important in the history of moneymaking. Old bills of record show the high financial dealings of our forefathers. In the early years, coins were pressed by hand on a machine such as this. Considering the tools they used, the quality and number of coins which the early mint turned out is truly remarkable. These scales were used to check the weight of metals in the 1800s, and it is a tribute to their maker that they are still accurate enough to be used today. Women control the nation's first string, so it is fitting that the making of coins is under the supervision of a woman. Mrs. Nellie Taylor Ross is director of the Mint and custodian of our vast gold and silver store. Next time you reach into your pocket for nickel to make a phone call, Stop a moment to think of the hours of work that went to produce that single coin. Various designs were submitted, one finally approved and sent to the engraving department of the mint. Here, an artist is putting the lettering and finishing touches on the original clay model of a medal bearing the likeness of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. From the clay, a plaster model is molded and finished by hand. And in turn, this is used to make a hard metal form from which the finished metal is reproduced in bronze. A transfer engraving machine reduces the original to a small die from which commemorative medals can be struck off. Beginning with George Washington, it has been the custom of the Mint to strike off medals bearing the likenesses of our presidents. And these handsome medallions may be purchased from the Philadelphia Mint. This exhibit shows a collection of galvanos, or single-faced designs of coins. These are the five coins of less than a dollar value which make up the bulk of the mint's output. Coin designs are changed at set intervals, but the size and metal content always remain the same. This is the transfer engraving machine, which reproduces mechanically the design of a large model on a small master die in steel. The sensitive pointer follows the raised figure of the coin to be copied. This is reproduced by the small cutter which carves out the design as it travels in endless concentric circles. This giant press uses the master die just completed to make many working dies. The blank piece of steel which will become one of these dies is in the form of a flattened cone. It is placed in the press and the stamping die is forced down upon it. The dial above shows that a pressure of 50 tons is forcing the blank and the master together. The press lifts again, and the blank piece of metal has become a perfect die. After being hardened, this die is ready to go to work, striking off actual coins. The metal content and fineness of coins is fixed by law. Here, metal is being weighed out for the making of pennies. A single penny weighs 48 grains and contains 95% copper, alloyed with 5% tin and zinc. Carefully weighed out in small units, the alloys are placed in a separate box, which will put in the melting crucible along with the pigs of pure copper. Each step is supervised by trained men. Their accurate work has built up over the years the unshakable confidence of the people in the money of their government. The carefully measured amounts of copper, tin, and zinc are ready for the furnace, but it is not stoked with metal haphazardly. The carefully measured portions are added exactly as they arrive from the weighing room. One at a time, the loader puts in the pure copper, tin, and zinc. Copper pigs in the furnace, and the alloy metals added. The door to the furnace is closed, leaving only a small hole for observation during the melting, and later for pouring out the molten metal. The electricity is turned on. Flames and vapor belch forth, and the temperature is carefully watched as these furnaces start their work of fusing a strong, long-wearing alloy. During the melting, the entire furnace rocks to and fro to aid in the mixing.
the employees of the Mint maintain a constant check on the coins they make, keeping them of uniformly high standards. When the melting has been completed, the delicate operation of tapping the furnace gets underway. Sputtering and sparking, the molten metal runs direct from the furnace into a carrier. This is transferred immediately to a rack where the molten metal is poured into special form. These molds form ingots of copper alloy 20 inches long. The metal quickly becomes solid and a workman breaks the form from around the ingot and gives it a steaming bath and a chemical solution. These ingots come from the bath, dull and rough finished. They are not ready for the punch presses yet. The thick slabs must pass between these powerful rolls 22 times. From a dull ingot 20 inches long, these operations produce a gleaming ribbon over 35 feet long. After preliminary rolling, the strips pass to the finishing mill, and the heavy slabs have become the microscopically exact thickness for a coin. The blanking press. Here, blank coins are cut out of the strips as easily as a housewife cuts out cookies from bath. The blanks, approximately coin size, are called planchets. After the planchets have been stamped from the strip, the remainder is returned to the furnaces for remelting. Nothing is wasted. All planchets pass onto the annealing ovens, for when they come from the blanking press, the blanks are too brittle to take a good impression. In these large ovens, they are softened by being reheated under carefully controlled conditions. Silver planchets, except those for dimes, are checked individually for weight. Then the planchets go to the tumbling barrels, where they are violently swirled around in a solution of warm water containing cream of tartar and soap bar. Cream of tartar has been found to be the most effective buffer for planchets. It does its work smoothly, leaving the blanks with a gleaming polish after they have been turned at high speed in these tumbling vats. With no more ceremony than a concrete mixer disgorging a load of cement, these barrels pour out their load of burnished metal, a brilliant cascade of shimmering copper. Now the blanks are ready for the last operation, the one which will turn them into money. Here is a bank of stamping presses in the Philadelphia Mint. They are capable of turning out over four million coins in a 24-hour day. What a contrast with those early hand presses, which managed to furnish the original states of our young country with less than half that number in two years. Here, greatly slowed down, is a stamping press at work. A collar holds the blank in place. The mighty jaws close, and a single operation stamps both sides and reads the edge. The finished coins fall from the bottom of the press into boxes, ready for final inspection. Ever on the watch for a defective coin, these girls make an expert check of all metal money. This extreme care acts as one protection against counterfeits. A bogus coin will differ in feel and weight from the genuine. And the truest test of silver money is the clear ringing sound it makes when dropped on some hard surface. Bad coins feel greasy to the touch and give out a dull clank when dropped. This machine is a regular mechanical miser, for it counts money all day long. Here, the finished specie is run like water from a tap into bags of various sizes to be sent to the Federal Reserve for distribution to banks, which replace coins as they wear out or become damaged in circulation. Each bulging bag contains $50 in gleaming new nickels, a thousand profiles of Thomas Jefferson, which will buy a thousand cups of coffee or 5,000 sticks of gum. Which of pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, and 50-cent pieces clink